Good afternoon. I'd like to begin the acknowledging the traditional owners of this land on which we meet today. I'd like to also pay my respects to the elders past and present. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us online today. My name's Jenny Farrah and I'm the Stakeholder Relationship Manager and Education Specialist at Media Super. It's important for Media Super to continually strengthen relationships and engage with Media Super members, partners and employers across Australia, which is why we're very proud to be a partner at this event, the business of freelancing. Thank you to the Walkley Foundation for their incredible work in forming, inspiring, building community and representing our sector. Just a little bit about Media Super. We're the only super fund dedicated to the print, media, entertainment and arts and creative industries. With a proven track record of strong returns and competitive fees and a unique understanding of our members' retirements and needs. As an industry fund, we run only to benefit members. And that means profits go back to our members' accounts, helping to maximise retirement savings. For over 30 years, we've been supporting our members employers, partners and community of industries. We work closely with our industry partners to help them build vibrant, robust sectors. As many of you know, Media Super has recently merged with CBAS to become part of a larger and growing fund. Both funds share the same values and mission, and this is to help members achieve better retirement outcomes. We also share a belief in responsible investment principles and incorporate this into our strategies with the investments team taking a whole of fund approach. Within CBUS, Media Super will continue as a brand and most, um, most products are offered by Media Super, who will also, um, which is all part, also part of the merger. So I would just like to say that we're really proud to be part of a, a partnership with the Walkley Foundation. And we look forward to building stronger relationships to better support the industry together. We have um, a number of uh, things that will be put in the chat. Um, we have a dedicated service team at all of our uh, major capital cities across the country. So if you're having any issues or any concerns about your, your superannuation, uh, you'll see all the contact details in the chat. Um, but once again, we are really pleased to be part of the partnership with the Walkley Foundation. I'd now like to hand over to Artie Bertiger who will be moderating today's panel of speakers. Artie's a multi-platform journalist now living in Canberra after spending over 10 years in India, where she reported across South Asia in print, radio, television, video, and online. Artie chiefly works for Monocle magazines and is rather popular online radio station, Monocle 24, and also contributes to a range of other outlets, including the ABC, the New York Times, and Wall Street Journal. Um, there's a number of others there too. So I'm now going to hand over. So thank you very much. Take care. Thanks so much, Jenny. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here and um, to have the opportunity to facilitate this webinar. I, I hope everyone gets a lot out of it. It's on the business of freelancing. I was a freelancer for a long time. Um, so I know very well the uh, unique challenges and specific pros and cons of it. And we've got this fantastic panel um, who all come from very different places and different spaces, so can speak speak to different elements of freelancing and hopefully we'll leave you with a very well-rounded impression of um, what it is to be a freelancer in the current economy. Um, maybe I'll just hand over to everyone to quickly introduce themselves, starting with Shona. Hello, I'm Shona Martin. I'm the CEO of the Walkley Foundation and I'm talking to you from our offices in Redfern, which is in Gadigal land um, of the Eora Nation. I'm a freelancer based in Hobart and um, I've been freelancing for 25 years for a range of publications and I'm one of the uh, co-founders of Tasmanian Inquirer, a small local news website. Dale? Oh, hello. Um, Dale Webster. I'm, um, I've been a journalist for um, ever since I left school. Uh, went through the, the regional provincial dailies, um, ended up in Darwin on the NT News, uh, then 
I ended up with News Limited again on the Weekly Times. So that uh, was my last mainstream media job. Um, like many, I was uh, made redundant and uh, I've been freelancing. Um, I have also spent a, a large um, chunk of my career working in media management as well. So I've got a little bit of um, insight into both, both sides of things. Andrew? Um, my name's Andrew Quilty. I'm a photographer and a, a writer and recently an, an author. Um, I've been based in Afghanistan for the better part of the last 10 years um, and I'm coming to you from my car in Sydney. Thanks, guys. Um, we've got a large chunk of time. We've got till two o'clock, but I think it'll really fly by. So there'll be a and a section at the end. But if you do have questions, please put them into the chat and um, someone please alert me to them if I don't notice them and we'll try to get to everyone's questions. Um, I think the biggest takeaway we'd like you to get out of today is it's not just about pitching an article and then waiting for a commission and then taking home your per word rate. There are other ways to get paid to do journalism and in particular to get funded to do public interest journalism, which kind of traditionally has been the poor cousin of, in the journalism world. But um, having said that, though, it's all very nuanced. I want to start with Shona Martin, who is with the Walkleys. Shona actually comes from the editing side of things. Shona, can you just uh, quickly take us through your background, please? Sure. Um, my background sta um, started in journalism. I was a cadet reporter in New Zealand, um, for starters, but then I moved into editing and edited Good Weekend. I worked as an editor at Vogue, started an ACP magazine called HQ magazine, and then diverted off to book publishing world, where I worked with many freelancers who were writing books before returning to the Sydney Morning Herald, editing the Spectrum section, and then ending up here at the Wall please. Great, thank you. Um, Shona, the biggest complaint I say that I hear from freelancers and I have as well of editors is just the absolute hell of pitching editors to receive radio silence. But I know that you guys have got your own pressures and your own processes. Can you please just take us through what it looks like to wake up to an, an, an inbox full of pitches every day and how you actually sort through it and make commissioning decisions? Um, look, I think it, it's obviously hugely daunting. Um, and so I suppose one of the first things that you notice if you're looking at an inbox, uh, do things have really specific headings on them, for example? If you're going to pitch a story to an editor who's receiving, you know, a lot of dross and in the middle of that there are a few diamonds, make sure that you you really specifically say offering exclusive interview about X or whatever it is. Um, I think that um, saves an awful lot of time. My biggest um, feeling would be that a lot of um, um, freelancers may be pitched too broadly or don't do the research about who they're pitching to. So um, from an editor's point of view, if somebody's offering you a health story and you'd never publish a health story in a million years, you're a business paper, um, then that probably... Um, means that you you know you may not even have time to send them a response. So I guess my message would be um, do your do your homework, find out the name of the editor if you can, make sure that you don't send a form letter where it still says you know dear Jenny when really I'm Shona. Um, you'd be amazed at how many um, you know times that happens, and just make sure that you're really professional and detailed in your approach. And that is you know it's not foolproof. Editors are as guilty as anyone is not responding to, to emails, but you increase your chances. What's a good length and a good structure for a pitching email? I mean, I know that I, I take a, an approach based in brevity. I try to keep it to a tight three pars and then one line about myself and a link to my work. Um, but how, what does a perfect pitch or a, a very commissionable pitch look like to you? Um, look, it probably depends on the detail of the story and whether you're a known quantity. Um, you know, if, if you haven't worked with an editor before, you probably need to very quickly just say, you know, I'm blah, I write for blah, blah, blah. Yes, your link's absolutely really good idea. And then you need to make sure that you summarise the key things about this story. You know, are you the only person who's got it? Are you the only person they're talking to? Is it time sensitive? So the story needs to run by 
know, next Friday, that would knock some people out straight away. Um, and then you need to, you know, not be flowery, not be ingratiating, not say you've always loved the publication or the person's work, that's just wasting time, um, but really get to the nuts and bolts of the story, the very thing that you will be showing as a journalist when you present your story. So it's almost like an audition tape itself, isn't it? The pitch, like you're showcasing how you write yeah. and how you'll write a story. Yes, yes. And the type of person you are. The professionalism is really important. What are you delivering? You know, or oh, and I will have, you know, three fabulous historic photographs or, you know, whatever you can give. Just spell it out. Don't um, don't don't have questions that hang that the editor has to come back um, to you um, to say, oh, are there any photos? Tell them. Um, that's, the best, that's the best thing. Are there any other um, gems of advice you can give to people who want to pitch um, a, a publication like Spectrum? Um, I think, again, it's about research. Um, you know, and making sure, perhaps doing some research and seeing, like, for example, if you're going to pitch a story about a famous artist, make sure that they haven't done the story about the same famous artist, you know, two weeks ago. You really need to give the impression that you're familiar with, um, with the publication. That is really, really important. Um, I think that the um, editors don't like surprises, but they do like detail. Um, and you do need to also be aware that if they do come back to you, make sure that you respond really quickly because they may be balancing, you know, they may have a hole the very moment that your email arrives and they want to hear back from you quickly because otherwise that other person a few emails down is going to get the moment. And I once um, read that you should have done about 30% of the work before you pitch. Would you hold that to be true? Um, look, in most instances, yes, there's no point in just saying, I'd like to do a story about Del Catherine Barton, say, you know, I mean, okay, well, there's lots of stories about her, what, what are you going to, to do or add, what's your angle, if it's an issue you're looking at, you know, what, what, you know, approach are you taking that would be different, and why is it appropriate to this publication in, in particular? Great. Thank you so much, Shona. Really, really useful. I want to move now to Bob Burton, a freelancer from Tasmania. Now, Bob, you've been a freelancer for many years and you wrote me a very, very comprehensive email full of amazing information that I think everyone should uh, have access to. But to start off with, can you just take us through the financials? How do you put together a pitch that will actually pay off? Well, I, th I think one other thing, if you're going to put a lot of work into crafting a really good pitch, uh, you want a pretty high strike rate because there's a lot of work that goes into a good pitch. So it really helps if you've had either work published in that publication before or you have a personal relationship with that particular editor. Um, or if you don't initially, then it should be part of your strategy over time to build up a personal connection with them. So your, your job is to make it as easy as possible for an editor to say yes um, and tick as many of the boxes at the first hit. Um, but it also helps of if you're thinking about a story you've, and there's a lot of work in doing the pitch, it helps if you've got fallback plans for publications B, C and D if your first one strikes out. And generally, you should be pitching for the publication that's going to treat you well, uh, pay the best rate, pay you on time. Um, the more time you have to spend either working at a, at a lower rate or stuffing around getting a paid, that's all your time. So it's, it's, it's making your administrative load bigger than it should be. Um, probably a couple of the other things um, is to be reasonably clear in your own mind um, how long it's likely to take. So the more expertise you've got on a particular story or something that you can see is going to develop over time. And I'm used to write for the news pages of the British Medical Journal uh, as a freelancer. And um, you know, at one stage, there was the uh, proposal over the free trade agreement with the US and the implications of that for a pharmaceutical benefit scheme. And so I could see that that was going to be a story that would run and run for quite a while. And so I could invest a fair amount of work in really understanding it at the front end in the knowledge that there was a, if I got one story up, then there was probably going to be another six or seven that would be a lot easier to do further down the track. 
Um, probably just two other quick points. One is um, uh, years ago, I got a, a, an unsolicited email from the uh, news editor of the uh, British Medical Journal just saying, you're fantastic to work with. Um, and I was a little bit taken aback to think, um, well, look, you know, very flattered and appreciate it, but um, what, are, what are others doing? And uh, she just said, well, look, you know, you deliver on time, you deliver what you said you would, you speak to the people that you say you're going to speak to, um, and you respond quickly to queries. Um, and so it was just doing the basics that made her life easy. Um, and she also went on to say that there were others who always wrote over length, took ages to respond to queries, and so she, it made it a lot easier for her to say no to them. Um, one of the things that's worth being clear on is when you're, when you're negotiating with an editor over story is to document what the terms of the actual deal are. So if there's any dispute later on, you've got it written down. And in particular, I'd flag copyright as one of the, the key things of if you're signing away copyright to the publisher, then you need to be clear on that. Or if you're keeping it, then that's you need to keep that um, clear as well. Thanks very much, Bob. Just on that, on copyright, I very rarely have that conversation about copyright. I'm just focused solely on the individual pitch. Is that something that freelancers should bear in mind? And are there any other kind of contractual issues that freelancers should bear in mind once they get that commission? Um, I, I think it's, it's, I mean, I generally work with publishers where I had a, a standard relationship with them and, and it was, you know, I'd be writing for them for years. Um, so it's, it's more important to get it clear up front of, are you retaining copyright or? I think uh, you copyrights, because what it means is that unless you're clear on it or unless they're clear on it, you don't want to dispute over it later, or you don't want to be, if you're thinking that I can afford to sink this much time into this story, thinking that you can do a repackaged version of it to sell somewhere else, then you need to be pretty clear about what rights you actually retain. Um, because publishers don't don't like it if you know the same version of a story turns up somewhere else shortly afterwards. Um, but you're within your rights if to do that if you've retained copyright and, and it's within the, the terms of the original agreement. And in particular, for example, if you if you go on to do a book, for example, um, you know, uh, you don't want to be caught by being constrained by not being able to reuse material that you've previously published in, in a book, even if it's in a reworked form. And who is the onus on to make to start this conversation? Uh, under the Copyright Act, you've got to you retain uh, right to the copyright unless you sign it away. Um, but uh, I'm generally a bit of a believer of if you're pitching to somebody for the first time, then you want to make it clear what what your preferred terms are, and if they're going to you know, disagree with it, or you know if they've got the, the company has got a standard contract of where they want you know perpetual rights for it, then at least you know the terms that you're entering uh, that arrangement on. What are some other considerations when you're signing a contract apart from copyright? Um, well, to be honest, I've never signed one. Um, Neither have I. I've been a long term, a long term um, editor with them, um, but that's been less as a freelancer and more as a sort of the equivalent of a part time contractor. Um, I have, you know, I think I originally got sent a, a new news corporate and, and past works that we've published for and the rights for more. And I thought, I think this is well, we're, we're losing you intermittently. I do have another question for you. Let's, I'll, I'll ask you and we'll see where we go. We might have to move on. Um, Take us through an ideal freelance week. How many words do you need to write? How many assignments? How much goes to tax? How much goes to super? How much is take home? How do you structure your time and make sure that you get paid what you need for that week? Well, I think the way that I've always approached it is, um, is to start with working out a budget for yourself. Um, 
people who are starting out as freelancers often tend to think that the uh, ME double rates seem very much on the high side. Um, they, you know, if uh, they see the figure of a dollar, dollar a word, they know how infrequently it's paid um, and think that it's a bit over the top. Whereas I think it, when you break it down, uh, you know, if you value your, you know, the MEAA rate is based on a J5 journalist. Um, so let's say you know, 60,000 or more, then you've got overheads on top of that. Let's say it's another 15,000. Um, then you've got to work out your time budget, which is, okay, you're going to give yourself holidays. You're going to allow for sick leave. You're going to allow for long service leave. You're going to pay yourself superannuation. Um, so at the end of all of that, uh, you end up with about 38, 39 weeks a year. Um, Sorry, I'll, I'll just so, backtrack. Yeah, you, can, you can fudge the numbers, but, but ultimately... Sorry, Bob, can I just interrupt? We lost you at the pivotal moment um, when you said 38, 39 weeks a year. Can you yep. just recap for us what you said? Yep. Um, so, I mean, after you've allowed for those basics of... Uh, holidays, long service leave equivalents, all of those things, you end up with about 38, 39 weeks. You know, if you want to have four weeks a year instead of six weeks, then you, you, know, you can extend it a little bit. But ultimately, you still need to be, uh, if you're in words, you, you need to be selling about two to 3,000 words a week at a, at a good rate to meet your target of 75 or $80,000 a year. So if you're not, um, you know, there are some publishers around who will pay 25 cents a word, um, particularly in some of the regional areas. And the reality of that is you're not being paid for the value of your skills. Uh, and it's very hard to see that uh, you can make that a sustainable long-term living without sacrificing your conditions. And I don't think you should. So, I mean, some of the other ways, you know, that I've seen um, people, um, you know, provide backstops for themselves is by having multiple irons in other fires, whether it's doing media training, whether it's editing websites, um, you know, taking photographs as well as doing stories, um, you know, video, a range of skills, you know, working as a fixer. Um, so a range of roles within the media area that give you the opportunity of, of getting some of the high paid gigs that, that if you can't get everything that's a high paid gig, that can at least offset some of the lower paid ones. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Bob. Really interesting insight. Dale, now I want to turn to you. You've received funding via grants. Can you just tell me about this experience um, and also how you handled the grant money? How did you make sure you didn't burn through it in the first week? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I'm probably a, a, a good case study of, um, of, you know how I said World War III might break out with the cats right at the pivotal moment? Yeah. Um, so, it's because sorry, I heard um, you. Yeah, no, they're in the background having a fight. Um, I'm a good case study for grant funding. I was, um, so I, I was working for the Weekly Times. I was made redundant um, and... I was considering options, what to do. I saw a, 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 an advertisement for of grant funding through the Walkley Foundation, specifically for regional journalists. And I applied and I was successful. And it, um, it really made a difference. That, that's how I got my um, stories up on, on bank closures that people sort of know me for now. Um, what I did with that money, I, originally I probably pitched to, you know, to um, for that money to cover some travel and, and that sort of thing. But COVID, it was right at the start of COVID, so everything changed. There was no travel. You know, there was we couldn't move, go move into state, couldn't do anything. Um, so it essentially went into hours. And my approach to freelancing, um, anyone who's made been made redundant would sympathise with this. You you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket again because it's you know having that rug pulled out from underneath you is is really quite traumatic. So I I took the approach of of trying to put together a portfolio of work and the grant funding allowed me to I allocated that to two days a week 
that I would work on the bank story. So essentially for that time, I was being paid to, to write research. Um, you know, I was working as a news journalist, which is um, pretty rare in the freelance world. It's, it's pretty hard to exclusively work on news because um, as Bob said, there's a lot of people interested in paying for stories on regional Australia. Um, so that that's how it helped me. It, it funded probably mostly the writing and the research um, and it went to hours so uh, um, I probably couldn't have done it without the grant, grant funding. I know there's not a lot of grant funding around but um, I'm hoping with what I've been able to do with mine it may encourage um, you know people to invest a bit more money into into that side of things. Yes we love grants. <laughs> um, Something else you raised is how to be taken seriously as a freelancer. And that's something that I've struggled with. You know, I, when I introduce myself as a freelancer, I can sometimes see that look in people's eyes. Like it's kind of like dismissal or, you're, you know, you have no, no status or no importance to me. Dale, you've got some really great tips here. Can you fill us in? Oh, it's the hardest thing is, is getting the story together. So this is the, the pitching your story is, is one thing, but to actually get out there and work as a journalist and we're so used to saying, I am Dale Webster from, and, you know, it's your, your entree into, to, you know, speaking to people. All of a sudden you don't have that from there. Um, I say that credibility yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and working on a grant, I had I wasn't even writing for someone. So at, at that particular grant, uh, it was we didn't have to pitch to you know we didn't have to say who was going to publish it, um, which in the end was terrific for me. That that worked really well. Um, but when you're going out there, when you all of a sudden you don't have the identity, so you create one for yourself. And I think. You take all the professionalism you had when you were working in in the in the system um, and apply it to what you're doing. Get yourself a, a professional email. Um, when you when emailing someone for a quote or a response or something like that, nothing looks worse than you know Gmail or or something like that. Um, I think it's really important to maintain your um, your ins well, you, you definitely have to maintain your insurances, but um, the Freelance Pro gives you a bit of credibility. They, it comes with the trust stamp. Um, my, my, the bottom of my emails always carry that. Um, and conduct yourself in a professional manner. Um, Shona mentioned this as well uh, with your pitching, but also conduct yourself in a professional manner when you're, you're seeking um, responses. You know, I've had to deal with... Um, you know, a lot of banks and, and things like that and, and structure your media inquiry properly. You know, media, the, the, your headline, your, your title should always be media inquiry so they, they can see it in their inbox if it's quite full. Um, tell them, you know, clearly what you want and always put a deadline. Um, that's, that's one thing um, that's really important because if you don't, even if you don't have a deadline, put something in because it's just going to get shuffled to the bottom of the queue. And if you don't put a deadline, it's also a pretty good marker that you're not really sure what you're on about. Um, and as I've learned, people don't have to answer your media inquiry. Um, so don't give them an excuse. That's, that's the main thing. So what else did I have on my list? Um, just trying to think that I sent you. Yeah, um, no, that, that pretty much covers it. As I said, be professional. And um, I've started asking, one of my bugbears is um, people who don't return emails um, or acknowledge emails. Um, when you're sitting out on your lonesome in a home office and you're sending things out, you don't always know that your professional email has actually worked. <laughs> Um, and has got caught up in a spam filter. So if you've sent out a, a request for information from a government department or someone like that, you know, I always said when I was working on that side of, side of things to, to junior staff, always acknowledge the emails. 
you know, even if it's just got it, we'll look at it. Um, it just, um, it makes a hell of a difference to people. So what I've started doing is also saying, can you please acknowledge this email? So at least I know it's landed. Um, I know I'm serious and I, I, I want some information. Excellent, excellent advice. I will definitely use those tips going forward. Shona, did you have anything to add to this uh, from the perspective of an editor? Um, well, I mean, I, I think Dale and I are very much on the, the same page. I mean, I suppose when, and, and also, you know, back to Bill's comments, I mean, I suppose one of the things that when you're starting writing the story, assuming that you've got the, the you know, you've got it sorted out. And I, and I also would agree with the point, um, after you've had the initial discussion with the editor, it's very easy for you to go back um, and just say, just confirming that I'll be delivering this story on blah, blah date and that you'll be paying me 80 cents a word. Um, most um, major organisations will assume that they are taking the copyright. So if that's not the case, um, then make sure you discuss it, you know, as you know, um, and say that you, you really don't you want that to happen. Um, some might say, oh, well, it's not possible to do that with our organisation. Um, that is possible for them to do it they can switch metadata on and off very easily to stop um, that sort of syndication and if they really want the story they will do it of course if they don't care about the story um, then it might be an excuse not to to go with you but definitely put everything in writing and then again to that point deliver on time deliver what you say there's nothing worse for an editor in terms of having to chase people up you know that you've got all this these issues planned and suddenly the story doesn't appear and that's where why the other important thing for freelancers is the you know once you're in with an editor they will keep getting you to do the story because you're the reliable person who always files on time and they know that you will put in the work even if it's not your normal area of endeavor um, that you will produce a good story in time um, with details checked um, all of those things really do make a difference if you've used sources that need checking make sure that you give the um you know the editor that detail make sure that they know that you give them if there's going to be photographs having to be to have to be taken don't wait for them to say oh have you got the subject's number give them as much detail as possible in a professional orderly and timely manner and you will get more work can i just say to raise a point that shona mm. you commented on the syndication um and i think that's um the difference between uh, the awareness of syndication is the difference between journalists that have actually worked in the industry and ones that have you know haven't maybe worked for one of the corporations i saw a comment recently on a freelance forum and and it was a, a freelancer who who was just furious that her story had she she'd given it to someone but it had ended up mm. being in another publication as well and it, you know it had gone through the network and um i just sort of said that's always been the case like it's if you mm. if you had a story in something it would it could end up in any of the the publications that say news limited owned or whatever the difference is these days that the the, the syndications are so big like mm. it's it's a shock to people where their stuff ends up they go across um you know the groups they have print they have television they have everything so um it is it's really important if that's going to be a concern to you to mention that when you're talking to an editor to say I just you know I don't know if it's possible to say I just want it in in this publication or not but um if it's going to be an issue raise it like Bob said at the at that start it is certainly possible to do that speaking for um nine print where I most recently worked um but there were very few instances where you know a journalist would negotiate with that and it did rely very much on the editor going into you know a sort of drop down menu and ticking a box kind of thing just to make sure that it didn't automatically feed out um yeah. but it is entirely possible to do and it of course all depends on if they want it they'll agree yeah I don't think people bring it up because they don't realize it until no. it, it's happened no. to them and and their stories just 
they've just lost control of it. It's yeah, it's, and they don't realize it until you know their friend in WA says, like, oh, I was just reading your story. Yeah, yeah. It's like when my sister got bitten on the ass by a pelican. She did. Yeah. <laughs> Awful. When <laughs> viral. Yeah. 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 Um You'll have to put a link to that story in the chat, Dale. Like that is just too good to let pass. Oh, the pelican. Yeah. The pelican. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, guys. I want to move on now to Andrew Quilty. Andrew's slightly differentiated from the rest of us um, who are freelance print journalists, mostly print, as a photographer and working abroad. And um, something I've noticed about photographers is that while they often operate individually they have really really good networks uh, collectives they work through agencies they get together and they organize amazing photo festivals where they talk about the not just the craft of photography but the business side of it and their great networking opportunities and can you please take us through this and maybe speak to why there is a need for this or a desire for this um, amongst photographers I think Artie it it's the 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 agency or the collective idea um, amongst photographers is one uh, is is a historical one. I think actually these days it's a little bit redundant. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't still exist and that photographers still um, uh, want to be a part of them. But I think the relationship between photographers and agencies and the the um, utility of agencies is probably not what it once was. Um, once upon a time before mobile phones and Skype and email, agencies were used as a, as a hub where a, an editor could, um, who, who an editor could contact and say, um, we're looking for a photographer in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Ukraine, um, who have you got? Now, um, with with um, the, the networks are the networks are a lot more democratized, and um, I, for example, I I now use Instagram as an in, informal kind of um, uh, agency pla uh, as an informal um, means of um, forecasting where I am, broadcasting where I am. Um, so. As I said in the past, um, it was it was used in this way. Now it's a little bit redundant because um, editors can um, bypass the the traditional um, agency um, this agency structure, meaning that um, that the the use of that of the agency for the photographer um, that, that that once existed is not so much it's not so necessary anymore. And the agency is effectively just a, a middleman taking a, a significant portion of of that um, of the cut. So um, the 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 role of agencies these days has a lot more to do with, um, uh, I suppose, prestige. It, it's certainly a good way for photographers to um, associate themselves with a prestigious uh, name of an agency um, to give to. Uh, lift their, their profile. Um, I, I find more and more photographers who are joining agencies um, based on th their idea of their, their historical idea of an agency and, and the um, historical um, utility of them uh, that they're that they're leaving the agencies because they don't find it um in a business sense as as useful as they as they once did and in fact that it can often uh, cost them a lot of money um or or that they have to um that that a lot of the uh, the, the the income that they're making on a job is is um soaked up by the agency so um having said that i i am part of an agency and i do um i i have structured my contract in a way that I'm comfortable with um, where I um, uh, that they give me work work comes from them from a specific um, uh, region that being Europe where I don't get a lot of work otherwise um, whereas I keep the US and Australia um, to myself because I have I have um, my own network 
in, in those regions. And um, it, it wouldn't make sense for me to forego the, um, or, or to cut that, um, to cut any income I have from them with the agency. Is it worth it though? I mean, the, the prestige factor, as you mentioned, of being associated with, I think your agency is seven in, in Paris or with Magnum? No, um, uh, I'm with Agence Vu. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, I mean, look, it's it's a question for the individual. As I said, I've, I have had a lot of friends who have joined and, and left um, various agencies because it hasn't been worth it to them. Um, I, I like it because it's, um, I mean, I, I have a partly it's a it's it's partly emotional for me I have a, a strong sense of loyalty to my agency and, and they to me um, we've sort of gone through thick and thin together and so we have a, a strong relationship in that sense and as I said I structured my contract in a way that I didn't feel as though I was losing out so it the, the benefits outweigh the the negatives for me. And what about collectives are they worth it? Well, collectives are um, a lot less formal. They often involve less um, financial outlay. It's, it's usually more of a um, like a, a, a passion project where um, photographers or um, those who have have, have common um, um, mediums can come together and as, as more of a community, as a way of um, as a place where they can share ideas and and get get feedback and so on maybe produce um, exhibitions or books and the like they're they're less often um, uh, business making ventures and and, and often are actually um, uh, sumps for for money like a um, that, that, that um, you know is a place where you can invest your the, the money that you earn from your, your bread and butter work um, and the 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 collect the, the work that goes towards a collective is often more um, of, a, of a more personal nature. Are there any elements of how photographers organise themselves that could be transposed to journalists uh, working in print? I mean, we can't really harness the power of Instagram to get our work out there. Um, but are there any other ways that you think any other ideas that we could take from photographers? Well, I suppose there are these other streams like um, Substack and, um, you know, self-publishing um, platforms. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with those. Um, I suppose, again, the, the benefit of um, working for an established organisation or outlet is that it comes with, with um, prestige and and um, a reputation which um, for something like for, for a self-publishing platform um, you have to establish that yourself establish your own name your own reputation yourself before you can um, before anyone is going to base their uh, consumption of, of information on that alone rather than than on a, a um, an outlet which has an existing reputation um, you know, there is obviously, um, are you asking for photographers or more for, for yourselves in, in print, I guess? Um, just ideas that we can take from photographers that can be applied to other mediums. Yeah, I, I suppose photographers are better at um, finding um, self-publishing, modes of self-publishing, which again, are, are rarely, rarely convert into um, income. Um, so I suppose the same applies to to print journalists, as I said, with these self publishing platforms, but th they come with the the same um, conundrums, I suppose. So I suppose the key takeaway message is just hustle really hard. What yeah, are you doing? I mean, yeah, there's there's no way around that. I mean, for me, I think, and I, having said that, there, there there are ways around it. I think for me, I found, and just to go back to this. Um, uh, the, the question of, of emailing and pitching. I found that once I was in, Af in Afghanistan, once I was sending um, emails with a subject line that, that started with Afghanistan, I was taken more seriously than I was, um, or, or at least the subject was taken more seriously. So I, obviously that is gonna depend on the 
relationship between the subject of the pitch and the and the um, the outlet, as as Shona mentioned. Um, but I just found far more often that the the um, places to which I was pitching, the editors to which I was pitching, um, um, were much more likely to get back to me with a, a story idea from Afghanistan than, for example, Sydney. Fascinating. I want to talk more about your time in Afghanistan, but we'll just stick to networking for now. And I want to turn to Bob. Um, Bob, how can freelance journalists network effectively? Um, do you have any practical ways that we can do this and what the benefit is? Yeah, I mean, look, in, I think there's a, a few um, states or cities where there's currently occasional freelance uh, drinks get-togethers. Um, I think it's really worth going along to those if there's one in your local neighbourhood. Um, if there isn't, then there's no harm trying to create your own. I mean, I started up a small group down here in Hobart uh, probably about five years ago. We haven't met post-COVID yet, but um, maybe maybe when the, we can get an outdoor venue in summer. Um, but, the, I mean, the benefit of that is, is just simply getting a better understanding of who there is around your local area who's freelancing. Um, sometimes, if you're in a lucky position where you've got too much work on, um, you don't really want to go back to an editor and just say, no, it's it's a lot better if you can say, well, look, I've got other commitments on at the moment, but here's somebody else who can help you with that story. So if you can always be in a position of solving editors' problems, that's uh, the pitch puts you in the good books. Um, but it's also, yeah, there's scope for collaborative projects. Um, it's, a, it's a way in which you can actually just, you know, if there's things you're uncert uncertain about or you need contacts or just to get, you know, if you're working, you're tired of just working from home, not meeting anybody uh, in, in your own professional circle, then it's, a, it's an opportunity for some you know, moral support as well. So I think there's, there's great value to them. Um, and, you know, look, look, I think it's, there's actually probably more freelancers around in your area than you, than you understand. It's once you start making inquiries that you discover that there's a whole bunch of other people who do occasional freelance projects or they're, they're doing bits and pieces of this. And you, you'll, you can learn a lot from just, just finding out who else there is out there that's doing stuff that you didn't know about. Right, thank you so much, Bob. Dale, I want to turn back to you. But first of all, we've got a question from one of our audience members. Um, she says, it's Eileen Ormsby. I have freelance pro wondering what the Trump, the trust stamp is that Dale mentioned. Can you just fill us in, Dale? Uh, it's a it's a little round MEAA um, stamp that, that I'm pretty sure it's called the trust stamp. Um, and it comes, they send it out when you join Freelance Pro. So maybe have a look back through your emails and see if it's there. If it's not, ask them to send it to you. Um, it's a, a, you know, just a, a JPEG that you can whack on anything. And it is supposed to represent that you're a, you're a professional. Um, I think there's a, a great package of work that the MEAA could do around the trust stamp. Um, I think you really need to earn it. Uh, but it's like a blue tick. Sorry? It's like a blue tick on Twitter. It's like this yeah, is a it is. real person, like freelancer. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, th I think it was the MEAA, -E could have been the Walkley Foundation, but last year they were running um, uh, sessions on all the, on the code of ethics on all the different subjects. And, and I think to get your trust stamp, you should be obliged to, to attend things like that and tick them off. So, you know, at the end of it, you people when they see the trust stamp it just doesn't mean that you're insured it also means that you're you're professional as well so um mark there's a message there from mark saying well it's jumping um he sent a link uh for the freelance trust mark it's called oh fantastic um if someone can just please stick that in the chat so everyone gets it that would be great um, Dale, I wanted to talk next about self-publishing. Now, I saw a graph on Twitter last week, someone posted, just showing the income of a self-published author's profits, which were in the six figures. And the whole idea was just to say, this is how much money you can actually make if you self-publish. Um, can you just tell us a bit more about self-publishing? I know that you've had some success with it. 
Um, I did it because I my my story was essentially paid for, so it was a, a grant funded story. Um, the, the, the first part of it is why I ended up doing that. Um, so I I pitched my story idea to some of the best journos in the country for this grant through the Walkley Foundation, and they said, "Yeah, we think that's a winner. Um, here's some money, go for it." So. I when I got the story finished I it, it was on the, the grant round was specifically for reporting on regional issues so it didn't matter if you're regional but it had to be regional issues so once I'd, I'd, I got this story together in the end um, I found that a massive tome of work on regional Australia was very very difficult to place there just wasn't the interest in um, uh, a regional issue. So I went through the process of trying to pitch it to people. And, you know, as I explained, I'm pretty professional. I um, made sure where I sent it, it was appropriate. Kept coming back with too long. It's all, you know, we love it, but it's too long, you know. And, and I went through the process of, you know, it's this really big organisation saying, so it was a 5,000 word story. We love it, but can you cut 3,000 words out of it? Um, I had another one, another editor who jumped in and, and stole, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have used that word, um, picked off the cream, cream. She rewrote it, took out the cream and said, how about we run this and we'll just point to your, you know, we'll point it to your piece somewhere. Um, and in the end, because of my circumstances at, at that time, um, I really just couldn't deal with the editors and the knockbacks and the, the, the emails not being answered and um, I thought I'm just going to put this out myself and it, uh, quite honestly it's the best thing I ever did. It, how, did um, you do, how did you put it out? How did you publish well, it? I, I did some like a newsletter or? Started learning about self-publishing. Um, my first step was through Medium. Um, I don't know if anyone's right. heard of Medium but it's yeah. the biggest self-publishing platform in the world and some of those figures that you quote um that's where people are earning that sort of money. But uh, I, my word of caution to people who think that they can earn a lot of money out of self-publishing, that's the cream, you know, that's that's right up at the top and, they, and they've get, people are getting pretty good at writing the sort of stuff that will give them. So did he publish it in one, one go, all 5,000 words? Did he break it up into yep. chapters, into different yep. posts? What was the engagement like on those posts and how did you promote them? Okay, so what when you self-publish, you basically become your your own circulation manager so we're all used to when you're working in the industry you you publish and you almost forget about the story you know you're relying on your your, your newspaper circulation or whatever and to see if you get impact but when you self-publish like I started from nothing like I had no followers so on medium it gives you the option um you can just put a story up as a as a journal or you can create a publication and just out of the blue I just went okay um I've just came up with this title and the regional and um I started the publication and I, I put my story up and the companion piece so all up I probably had about 7,000 words um and it sounds a lot but it only takes you 20 minutes to read a story like that so you know it's not as if it was massive um, but then I started, as I said, I, I worked as my own circulation manager and I just started sticking it under people's noses and, and it went from there. And social media, as, as Andrew said, you know, it's, it's become so powerful. You, that's where your contacts are made. And um, you, know, you don't get the volume, but you get the quality. People who are really interested in your subject area will read your stuff. And and they will share it with their friends. And um, then I moved on to, I built my own website with the regional. Um, that sort of took over from Medium. But Medium was was perfectly, you know, it was a, a good platform. And, and I was able to start saying when I was ringing people to do sort of follow-ups with it, um, Dale from the regional, you know, I had that identity thing again. But um, um, did he make any money? Well, that's what I'm saying. I the, the story was grant funded. I didn't need to. 
yeah, yeah. I, I can, through medium did you were you able to make any money from oh, it no oh hang on no I tell a lie I think I made about 75 cents so <laughs> <laughs> seriously like that that's the reality of some of those self-publishing platforms you've got to get a lot of people to to follow it so um, it was, I probably got more, once I got it onto my own website, the readership was, was better. Um, so then I, um, you can start looking for good, there's some good publishers out there who will run your stuff. Um, Independent Australia is terrific. So I can highly recommend them and they've got the reach. So they've, that sort of got the circulation out a bit further, but um, it, look, it depends on your motivation this story was my baby. Like it, it is literally, I'm so attached to it. I work on it every day still. I still update the figures. Um, not every story you do will be like this, but I think there's journos out there who, who write pieces for a reason. And for me, this is one of them. So I was more interested in creating an, you know, having an impact with it. Um, and and were the, was whoever gave you the grant, were they happy with the, was there any feedback from them about the, the self-publishing model that you chose or would they have, did they indicate they would prefer to say a legacy publication? Um, I haven't had any comments, but I have won um, a major award from them. So, um, you know, I've picked up freelance journalist of the year for the, this parcel of work um, from the Walkley Foundation. Um, so I, I hope they're happy. Um, I think I think it really shows what can be done with an investment in independent journalism. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Please put a link to the story to your baby in the chat <laughs> so everyone can see the fruits of your labor. Yeah. Um, Bob, are there any other tools that can be drawn on when freelancing? We've covered, uh, Instagram, Substack and Medium, are there any other tools that you know of and how can freelancers harness them to best advantage? Well, and think, please do um, cover off um, Freelance Pro and Rate Tracker as well. Yeah, um, look, I'll, I'll start with what the MEAA already has. Um, there's the, the Rate Tracker, which has been around, I don't know, maybe a year or two now, maybe a bit longer. Um, so it basically just has a listing of who pays what. Um, people can submit anonymously rates that they've been paid by different public publications. So that's that's your friend, because when you're working out who you might want to pitch a story to, it makes sense to pitch to those who pay highest and then work your way down the list if you have to. Um, the Freelance Pro is an insurance policy that covers defamation insurance. I think there's other insurance elements to it, but for me, it's, um, it's a defamation insurance side that's... That's the key element. Um, so I think that's about, uh, at least for me, it works out at about a thousand bucks a year. Um, and I would say that one other key point about belonging to the MEAA is increasingly there's more emphasis on uh, pushing for publishers to pay higher rates. So just going back to how you construct your budget, if you if you were aiming to earn eighty thousand dollars in a year at a dollar a word, so that's eighty thousand words. So if the MEAA uh, pushes publishers to pay an extra five cents a word over a year, that's worth $4,000 to you. So be, being a member and helping um, support that push is um, good business sense, even if um, you weren't sold on the idea because it's, you know, it's, it's an appropriate union for you or um, you know, at the training opportunities, et cetera. Um, there's also the code of ethics, and I think it's important for people to always keep in mind, particularly for freelancers of, you know, there can be tricky situations when people are, um, you know, doing media training work or, you know, if, if they're doing work for non-profit groups or government agencies or uh, companies and then switching back to doing freelance writing. Um, it's important to be familiar with it and, and preferably to have somebody that you can talk over any concerns that you might have before you you uh, take it any further. Um, there's also um, the media awards, which I think, in, again, increasingly the MEAA is including a category for freelance journalists. So it's worth keeping that in mind as a way of highlighting the best of your work in your state. Um, the Australian Tax Office also have a guide for the sorts of items that you can claim 
uh, as, as uh, deductions. So it's worth uh, a simple Google search on ATO and uh, journalist deductions, you'll, you'll land on it. Um, and probably the other one that's often gets uh, ignored, and again, this comes back to copyright, is uh, the educational lending rights and the public lending rights scheme, um, where if you've, say, for example, publish a book and then that becomes part of the reading material at a university course or something, uh, then there's a way in which they, they estimate over a year uh, how much you should get paid for the, uh, for the use of or access to your copyright material. Um, and so for that can be quite significant for some publishers, or it can be a useful little surprise at the end of uh, at the end of the financial year. Um, so Is that something that you have to sign up for specifically? Uh, yeah, you've, you've, you've got to register what works um, you have uh, submitted. Now, generally, if you're working on a contract for a major uh, news company, then often they will want to, um, or even some, I think some publishers of books will want uh, those educational lending rights. Um, but it's worth, again, keeping that in mind when you're looking at uh, copyright issues for, for what work you do. Would you mind just sticking a few of those, just to, they don't have to be links, but just the names of them into the chat in case anyone missed them, please. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Bob. Um, did you want to cover off Patreon at all? Sorry, Bob, did you, did you hear that? Sorry, it just dropped out, I'm afraid. Oh. Did you want to talk about Patreon? Uh, yeah, look, just um, just going back to that issue of, of, of self-publishing. Um, I mean, myself and two other local freelancers set up our, our own local news website, which is an occasional thing. And, you know, we're getting to the stage where it's, um, you know, it, it's reasonably viable. Um, if we double it, we'll be in a much more com comfortable position. But that same principle, which is, you know, we're not aiming to be a high volume publisher. We're aiming to get a, a local support base for doing stuff that nobody else is going to do. Um, and that base is out there and they're willing to, you know, our site is totally open access. People don't have to, there's no paywall. People can contribute and they do. Um, and just going back to one of the points that Dale made is, um, you know, some stories you'll do, you'll get nothing in response or very little. But then other times, hundreds of dollars will come in and you think, what's the logic of that? And I think the logic really is, is that uh, people have seen enough of your work and think they're doing good stuff. And it's not because of the specifics of a particular story, but they, they've got to the stage of thinking, I should be helping support doing more, more of that sort of work. And so there, there are freelance journals around who um, you know, have set up accounts on Patreon and Substack and elsewhere. And I wouldn't want to oversell it as being um, a panacea, this is how you'll fund all of your, your uh, you know, freelancing um, income. But there's enough people around who are doing reasonably well out of it so that it takes that pressure out of being on the daily treadmill where they can, they can plan each week if they've got enough income from their, their uh, supporter base to cover one or two days a week, uh, a week where they don't have to get stressed out about doing lots of pictures in a week. Can I just jump in there um, on that subject? Um, there's a question uh, that's come in about someone asking specifically that on the uncertainty of freelance work and how to manage it. And one of the points that I, I didn't make um, when I was talking about the grant funding and, and my income portfolio. Um, so for me personally, when I first started doing this to manage the uncertainty, I, I started a separate bank account and I started paying everything would go into that bank account and then I would pay myself a regular wage every week and and I knew how much roughly was in that bank account but I also knew how much it would how long it'd last but I had a regular wage coming in each each week and I think that psychologically really made a difference and um I, I broke up my portfolio I had a, a what I always call the the grocery job so you know a, just a part-time job that had paid you know three days a week and I knew that would would cover you know groceries or mortgage or something like that and then I allocated my my grant funding to two days a week um, um, and I knew how long that would last so that money was in a separate bank account and it was just drawn on at, at a, there's always the same sum of money coming into my working account all the time um, 
And then you, you have your other parcels of work, which was, you know, photography for me and different bits and pieces. So um, you weren't just relying on one, one thing um, or I wasn't relying on, on just one thing. Um, so uh, in answer to the, the person who asked that question, that, that was how I approached that. Thanks so much, Dale. Um, just speaking about Patreon, I have spent a bit of time look, checking it, the platform out and doing some sums. And the biggest, um, in terms of your followers and your paid followers, it's just like, you know, um, small amounts of money, $2 a month. I support a bunch of people. But you can actually make money from it. I think one of the most successful Australian journalists who are on it has, you know, maybe 10,000 followers. And if they all paid, say, I've, I've done some preliminary sums, but I estimate that he would make about $40,000 a year from that platform. And that's not to be laughed at. Like, that's a really good kind of backbone to your income. Um, and of course, you have to keep feeding the beast. But you know that your supporters are engaged followers who trust you and really want you to succeed. So um, it's a really good platform. Um, thanks so much, Bob and Dale. I wanna move back to Andrew now. There's a question for you. You mentioned that the agency model is dated and also that having your work on Instagram will not get you paid work. How do freelance photographers get more paid work and how do they actually pitch to publications or websites? Um, I don't think I said that um, Instagram doesn't necessarily get your work. Um, I've certainly got work through Instagram. And the way I usually do that, as I mentioned before, often it's just a matter of um, indicating that you are in a place where editors will be looking for photographers. Um, that's usually pertinent to um, for example, now Ukraine, if I was going to Ukraine, I would be, first thing I would be doing when I got there would be um, uh, trying, to, trying to take a photo that I could use to broadcast the fact that I'm there and available for work. Um, and, and I use, uh, I mean, that in Afghanistan for me, um, after a while, that was, um, that, 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 would, that became sort of widely known amongst my network because I, I, I lived there basically. Um, but certainly in the beginning, that, that was something I did. Um, over the years, I would, I slightly refine that and I would often, I would give a hint to a story. Um, if I, if I hadn't already got a commission, I would, I, I might post a, a photo and a, and a short text about, um, the context around the photo as a, almost like a um, uh, th throwing out some bait and often not often occasionally that ended in a in a commission someone would an editor would get in touch and say hey have you um, placed this st story yet if not um, we're interested and and it would be uh, developed from there so that was um, that's certainly a way that um, that you can um, increase your work as a freelancer so basically a first trap a first trap. This is a new term to me. Yeah, yeah. like a, a freelancer first trap. Yeah. <laughs> so you spent about a decade in Kabul, and I I did a similar stint in India. And something that plagued me the entire time I was there was this expectation that I'd have to cover the expenses, um, pay up front for expenses, for travel costs, even for fixes, and then wait sometimes four to six months to be reimbursed. Is that something that you experienced, and how did you deal with it? Um, I think it, it depended on the client, the outlet, the, the more reputable ones I found were less likely to expect that. Um, those who did expect it, I found were, um, probably either, um, didn't understand the, the complexities of, of working in a place like India or Afghanistan. And I was always very quick to, to shut that down. Um, and look, I mean, I, I was in a lucky position where I got to a point where I was established enough that I could say no if the, um, the, the, the obligations um, were not sufficient um, from my point of view. Um, and I know less established journalists and photographers in Afghanistan who 
would um, would suck that up and and would um, and you know kind of bemoan to me like how do I do this? I mean, I found this. This is also something that was um, um, prevalent for um, journalists and photographers from specific countries. For example, France pay their uh, freelancers terribly, and often um, journalists would be writing and creating stories or making films where they were losing money because they, um, on the one hand, they um, they they wanted to get published, um, but they weren't established enough to be able to. Um, stand up to editors who were expecting them to um, foot the bill for, as he said, fixes or translators or um, accommodation or flights or, or, or all these things. Um, so, I mean, yeah, look, it, it, it depends on the extent to which you're established in your field um, to, 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 um, to, to the degree to which you can push back against these um, overly onerous expectations. It's quite paradoxical, isn't it? You know, you have to get to that point where you have agency and power and probably some money in the bank to be able to say no. Very to much so. Stories. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really difficult. I remember being in situations where I was down to my last hundred dollars because I'd had to spend so much to do the story. Yeah, it's very, very tricky. So I empathise with anyone in that mm. situation. Andrew, did you just cover Afghanistan or do you do you go where the assignment takes you? And what, what are the pros and cons of taking on a region like Afpac? Mm. Well, I first moved to Afghanistan in late 2013 um, and I sort of established myself in Kabul in 2014. Throughout 2014, I... I bounced between Afghanistan and Iraq, Syria, and Turkey when um, when ISIS was um, kicking off there, and I made probably five trips to from Kabul to to that region um, to the Middle East at that time. Um, at the end of that year, however, I just I I made a very conscious decision that I wanted to focus solely on Afghanistan. I wanted to become a, a Afghan specialist, and um, it, I mean, it, it comes with pros and cons. I, as I said, it, for, for editors, they knew I was I was always there or almost always there and could rely on me to be there. Um, and obviously also I gained an, an understanding of, of that country um, that was not watered down by me um, focusing on or spreading, my, spreading myself thin and, and covering all sorts of different places. That certainly helped me um, when I moved more into writing. Um, I think photographers, for photographers, it's a little easier to, to bounce around on, on different subjects because there's less expectation of um, deep, nuanced understanding of the subject, which is um, a, lot, a lot more um, necessary for, for writers, I think. Um, I think the, the major con, or one of them, would be what happens when you inevitably um, become tired of a place or want to leave for another reason and your name and your identity and your um, your base of knowledge is entirely caught up in this one place and I'm very much um, in that position at the moment where I you know I, I don't know I don't know much about anything else um, beyond Afghanistan and I'm going to have to really reinvent myself whereas photographers journalists who are, are based somewhere and and um parachute in um depending where the news is depending um what their interests are um and what the what stories they're interested in focusing on um they can be uh, more professionally resilient and um as well as reactive and um i, I suppose that gives them a little bit more um uh, latitude when it comes to I mean you could because you're not you're not going to reach a point where you want to um, uh, well it's le less likely that you're going to reach a position where you have to entirely re reinvent yourself that the changes are more incremental and 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 you also um, I suppose get become known for someone who uh, covers hot spots rather than someone who's a, a specialist um, I, you know, right now I probably partly regret that I, I didn't do a little bit more of that. So I'm, I, I can 
um, my, my, my knowledge and my worth to editors is a little bit more diverse, but you know, th these are the um, decisions we make and, and I am where I am. Yeah, that's so true. And I think that can kind of, everyone can relate to that in terms of building a niche, working at it, becoming known for it, and then getting tired of it, wanting to move on. You know, it's always a conundrum. Thank you so much, Andrew. Dale, I want to turn back to you. And you wrote in your um, email to me a very um, powerful uh, few pars about the issue of mental health, which is a bit of a curly one. And I think we've all dealt with mental health um, leaps caused by the uncertainties of freelancing at some point, you know, the endless rejection, the isolation, the underpayment. Um, you know, I really, I really love freelancing. I loved it when I did it, but I hate being alone. So the isolation always really affected me. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your experience of this, if you like, or if you have any tips? And we've also had a question um, from someone in the audience, again, on the same um, general topic. How do you deal with the uncertainty of freelance work? How do you manage the loneliness of freelancing? Mm, yeah, that, that was the one I jumped in and spoke about before. And I was talking about the income portfolio. Um, uh, the irony is um, it wasn't the freelance that brought me unstuck. Um, it was the paid employment um, component of my portfolio. Um, I suffered a workplace injury and um, uh, that's why, you know, basically for the last few couple of years, all you've seen is my bank stuff. So um, I managed to get that finished. But uh, while I was trying to, you know, finish it up and pitch it and um, and find a place for it, find, find a platform for it. I was dealing with really, really severe um, mental health issues, so anxiety and depression. And, um, you know, it was one thing to finish the story. Getting it out there in place was, was just a, a bridge too far, and that led to my decision to um, self-publish. And as I said, it was the best thing I did. So... I think um, you've got to do what you can manage. And for me, I made that decision. All I can manage is to get the story out there on my own terms. Um, it, um, there's a question there, a follow-up to the one that was asked before, you know, how do you, how do you avoid spending too much time doing these things and, and should you be working for free? And, and I think the question when someone asks you how much free work should you be doing? Um, I would ask, is it development work or are you actually you know, working for free for someone? And, and I would always encourage people to, if you're, put the time into development. Um, that's what sort of got me through. I, I have a, um, you know, I, I mentioned the regional. I, I have my title that I publish under and, I spend a lot of time, quite regulated hours, because insomnia was what's one of the, the um, big impacts of, of what happened to me. Um, I'm very careful that I don't sit up all night and work. I'm very structured in, um, I've, I've got the insomnia under control now. So I, I let myself wake up naturally and I don't work past a certain time. So you manage yourself like that. Um, I think if you're sitting up all night and your sleep is starting to be affected um, and you're worrying, that's one of the, the, the worst things. Um, in my notes, I've got that you wanted to know how to safeguard your mental health. Um, it's, it's a massive, massive question. Um, and it's, it, there's no easy, easy fix to it. Um, staying connected is important, but uh, I, like Bob, am regional. Um, I work, have a little home office. So you've met my cats. They, they keep me company all day. Um, I think, the, you know, having one story that really that you're passionate about and getting it out there with, into the awards was a good thing to me, to the, into the awards process. Um, it reconnected me with people. Um, it... Um, 
I don't know. It just it it gives you a little bit more confidence, and I think uh, mental health has, is has a lot to do with confidence. And um, the more you you can sort of just have those little wins. Um, for me, I found that there were, it was very small increments to what was good and what was bad. So it would only take a little thing to to like an email not being returned to um, tip me that way, but it would also take just a little thing on the other side, you know, an, an email being answered to, to make me feel better. So I think as an industry, any editors out there need to probably be a little bit more conscious um, of the person on the other end. Uh, not everyone is going to be, um, be carrying a workplace injury, um, but a hell of a lot of us have been through the redundancy process and, um, and lost jobs and, and lost our sense of identity. So, um, you know, just a little bit more kindness out there from the industry would be nice. Um, I don't know, what else can yeah, I say? Every, every ghosted email feels like another rejection, doesn't it? And it kind of compounds this sense of being constantly rejected, especially if, if people are like you, have been through a redundancy round and are feeling a bit battered and bruised from that. Well, you're feeling as if you don't, you've lost your place in the industry and that, that one return, not returned email um, can, can mean a lot. It just increases the isolation a lot more. Look, I've worked, worked in mainstream. I know people are busy. I know their inboxes are full, but um, get a system together, you know, get, have it on your website. How do, how do you want to see your pictures and, um, you know, uh, just, just some way um to to acknowledge people and, and it's not just it's not just commissioning editors that this problem is with i've i've experienced um, um enormous problems getting information for my stories as I, I talked about putting in the media inquiries um everyone loves uh a journo until they start asking hard questions um and you know i've been completely cut off by some of the banks that i've been reporting on um, that's a sign of a job well done I think ah uh, yes yes and when the Australian Banking Association followed me on Twitter that was you know I thought they're paying attention but yes yes you know you're doing your job when they're not don't want to talk to you but um, well, I think this is where networking comes in like for me being part of freelance networks where everyone has that same experience and everyone can reflect back to me that they're going through the same thing, they're going through the same kind of emotional roller coaster when you don't get emails replied to or a story falls through or a commission doesn't go your way or you're not paid on time. Everyone's going through those same things. So having that, having that community of like-minded people is incredibly powerful and, and really meaningful in those situations. Another thing that I did when I lived in India, I joined a share office with people from different industries. You know, one was an NGO worker, one was a photographer, one was a, a graphic designer. So we could actually feed in, into, like I got ideas from them, um, but I also had relationships that were outside kind of this, this sphere of journalism, which kind of kept me excited about my work. I didn't feel like I was locked in competition with the people I spent the most time with. And that to me was really, really, really helpful. Does yeah, anyone else have me, anything? Oh, sorry, I was just jumping on that, having that one thing, you know, one story that you, you're you passionate about um, and, and you know inside out, Andrew touched on this, you know, it's, yes, it can be a problem if you, you are specialised, but I think freelance journalists are in the privileged position where they can, like the stuff I've done, I could have never done working in a newsroom. Like it just took so much time. Um, it just, uh, and, and, the, and the follow up and everything else, it, it was, it's, you can do it as a freelancer. And so I don't think you should ever regret becoming a specialist in your area. And I suppose you've just got to like, I'm bloody sick of counting banks. I am just, I'm wanting them to sort this issue out, but and so sooner or later, it won't be, you know, it'll, I'll be a bit like Andrew, it, it, banks will be behind me and I'll be looking for another subject. So, but, but they'll always, that knowledge will always be there and I'm sure it can be used somewhere else. But, but having something you're passionate and interested in is, is good. It's, um, it, it, it can provide structure to your day when you don't have it, and, you know. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Dale. Does anyone else have anything to add to that particular topic? 
of how to safeguard your mental health when you're dealing with the precarity of freelancing. I just make one of the one point really is that a lot of this you can take a lot of the stress out of it either two ways. One is ha having some gig that's two or three days a week that is the bedrock for what you do, and then you, you reduce the amount of you know, unknown time to something that's a bit more manageable. Um, I've essentially been doing various versions of editing websites or doing you know, weekly or quarterly newsletters for most of the last 25 years. And so that for me has been a key to what I've had to see that the years where I was doing you know, four or five stories a week and it was, the, you know, the treadmill effect was a bit wearing. Um, that's another point I was going to make, but I've forgotten that. Anyway, I'll come back, I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak to a few of the points raised in the chat. I forgot to mention up front, but I'm with um, the union, I'm with Mia, I'm on the freelance committee, and I'm also the vice president of the ACT branch of the union. So if you're in the ACT, please come to our next drink session and say hello. Um, in terms of freelancers, I don't have firm numbers. Maybe Jenny can help out a bit more with that, or Gemma, but... Um, I do know anecdotally that the union expects freelancers to form the bulk or more than 50% of the union membership in coming years. So he's really pivoting to pay more attention to freelancers. And we are kind of the forgotten cousins of newsroom staff. You know, we have been left out of, out of a lot of bargaining. rounds but a lot of work is going into it now um, and it's happening on a, a workplace basis so you know there's been a, a round with nine recently there was a round with the guardian recently um, sorry, um, so there is a lot of activity on that front uh, a few recent wins um, one was to get a, a bottom price uh, like a, a higher price per word of rate from the Guardian. And another recent win was to get more recognition of the need to pay superannuation on top of the per word rate to freelancers. And that's been taken up by the ABC. So there is work happening. Um, please, if you're not a member, please consider joining the union. There's always strength in numbers. Um, and the union is very devoted to acting in the interests of freelancers. Has anyone got any more questions? Please, if I've missed any in the chat, please alert me to them. Is this being recorded, Gemma? Is Gemma still around? Jenny? Yeah, I've seen the answer to that. I can answer if it's in the chat. Uh, yes, it'll be available in the next couple of weeks. So, yeah. Oh, I do have a question down here. Um, do you recommend freelancing to recent journalism and graduates or is it better to try to get a job in a media organisation? Does anyone have anything to add to say about that? I've, nev I've never worked in a media organisation and I thoroughly recommend it. Um, I, I mean, to me, um, I've always enjoyed my independence and I think uh, particularly given the options down here in, in, in Tassie, being confined to a newsroom, I would just find way too frustrating. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of freedom that goes with um, being independent. Equally, if you're just starting out, uh, one of the big challenges you will find is um, how do you create those personal connections with commissioning editors? And people who've worked in a newsroom and then go freelance have got a whole set of uh, you know, personal contacts that make it very easy for them. So if you're finishing your journalism degree or whatever and then wanting to go freelance, you can do it, um, but you just need to be mindful of how to structure your, your budget and your time and how you make those connections as fast as possible. And I think in that sense, I mean, there is a benefit of specialising in the sense of, you know, if you know something, a topic really well that you think is going to run for a long period of time or a theme area, um, then that becomes your brand and you become known for it. So that becomes a lot easier for you to sell, sell stories. And I mean, I think one of the things that's worth flagging is that, you know, in a regional area like Tassie, there's a limited number of outlets that tend to have very small freelance budgets and some of them pay badly. Um, so your options then are either you create something for yourself, uh, you work with some of the national networks, some of the national mastheads where you can pitch stories, 
or you also have some of the international outlets and particularly ones where the currency is stronger than the Australian dollar. So you can, they might not be paying great rates, but because of the currency fluctuation, you can still do well. Like one of my most profitable times was when the Australian dollar was totally crap against the US dollar and the British pound at the same time. That is excellent advice. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you so much, Dale, Andrew and Shona for your time. This has been a really great chat. Um, I think it's time to wind up now. Can I think this um, chat will be, um, I think there'll be a recording of this session available on the Walkley's website and will also be in the Walkley's newsletter. Um, thanks to everyone who came along and joined this chat. I really hope you got some um, fruitful information out of it. Wonderful. See you all. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a great Bye. day.